Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the CrossFit Edwardsville Community Podcast. Excited to have you here. I'm your co-host, Dallas Amston. I am the Chief Ignition Officer for Men of Faith and Fire, another podcast that helps Christian dads get on point and on fire in their life and in their business. And uh, with us today, uh, same as same crew as the last couple of episodes, so we're excited to have them all back. Uh, we've got our coaches here. We've got Coach G. Skell. He is the CEO and founder of CrossFit Edwardsville. He's a doctor of physical therapy. You know this already because you listen to him, you know him, and you love him. Um, but uh, he, he has uh, over 18 years learning and practicing the art, science, and psychology of nutrition. Also with us is Coach Kelsey, and um, she is uh, a nutritional therapy practitioner, strength coach, and a regenerative farmer. She's the founder of Ignite Nourish Thrive, a health coaching practice. And then also with us, as always, is Sean Crocker. He's, a, uh, he's the head programmer here at CrossFit Edwardsville. He's a WAG credentialed nutrition coach. Uh, that's the Working Against Gravity organization. He's an AFAA and NASM approved coaching program, and uh, he empowers his clients to lose weight, gain muscle, and increase performance and feel better through customized one-on-one -on -one nutrition coaching. Um, he's also the Edwardsville Intelligencer's 2020 uh, Coach of the Year and uh, Nutrition and Fitness Weight Loss Coach of the Year. So excited to have all of you back again today. G Scale, welcome back to the podcast. Good to be here, man. I'm excited yeah. to talk to you guys. Kelsey, how the heck are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm doing great. And uh, Coach Sean, good to have you here, man. How are you feeling today? Good. I'm just noticing that your entire backdrop is different. My entire backdrop is different. Uh, I, I'm actually at the ACA Business Club. It's where uh, I serve also in one of my roles as a business coach. And uh, so I'm just in a different room today than normal because that other room was being taken by another client. <laughs> so I for those of you- our three, our three nutrition podcasts, Dallas has had a different backdrop each time. I think, I yeah. think you're right. I think you're right. I'm the, uh, I'm the gypsy of the podcast <laughs> world. Give me a laptop and I can go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so everybody, great to have you all here. I'm not used to the questions coming my way, but uh, as always, you can check out these episodes at CrossFitEdwardsville.com. We also have other resources such as eBooks for you. There you can sign up for um, some coaching. You can sign up to take a class here at CrossFit Edwardsville. But really the reason we're doing these conversations is um, this is the CrossFit Edwardsville community podcast. And we want to make sure that we are um, providing an atmosphere for our CrossFitters, um, for those who are new to that world, and then also for nutrition conversations, just health and wellness, fitness and lifestyle. So this is a time where we're talking specifically with our coaches today, but, um, but there are other times that we're going to be talking with members of our community as well. And specifically today, this is kind of part three of a uh, nutrition conversation. We've, we've talked about some of the myths and the misconceptions uh, around nutrition. We talked about some of the obstacles such as time, money, and social pressures. And today uh, we're actually gonna be kind of steering it in a new direction and talking about making healthy eating enjoyable and delicious. And um, so this conversation isn't going to be so much a, hey, point one, what do you all have to say about time? Point two, what do you have to say about money? We really want to just kind of make this a little bit more of a roundtable discussion. So there's a chance I'm going to take a back seat today. And uh, I'm just going to lob the first question on the table here. You all are ready to go. Ready. Yeah. All right. I'm getting nods and smiles. Uh, for those of you who are listening to this as an audio only version, you got to check us out on our CrossFit Edwardsville YouTube page also. But Here's the first question out the gate, everybody. Can we really enjoy eating in a healthy way? Now, we've talked about this a little bit in the last couple of weeks, as well as there are great decisions you can make. There are flavors and palates and things you can play with. But really, long term, can we really enjoy eating in a healthy way? So I'm going to lob that out there and let you guys discuss. Go. Absolutely. I, for one, I, I really really enjoy my food. 
And I've been eating essentially on plan for several years straight. So it's a hell of a yes from me. Yeah, I would. I agree. Um, I'm even going to get scandalous and gossip a little bit today. So Go. we just we just closed out a holiday season where we didn't travel. We did three holidays in a row with just my four person family. And mm -hmm. my husband and I remarked how much better the food was because it was all nutrient dense, well seasoned, homemade versus going someplace else and eating big fat question mark and then we felt better too we didn't end the holiday season feeling like we just got hit by a train so totally possible totally sure possible. and now with your bad self kelsey yeah i don't think that was too gossipy <laughs> kelsey i don't think that was i too just much. hope none of my in-laws listen listen to this too much scandal <laughs> i personally hope they do and i hope they text you all afterwards yeah if you need to reach out to her everybody that's <laughs> at kelsey albers <laughs> Somebody once told me that it's a pro tip amongst uh, podcasters to get your guests to, to drop the names of their social circles because it's, it's a ready excuse to get them to listen to the podcast and expand your audience. That's hilarious. Uh, and, and obviously, controversy breeds cash. So way to go, Kelsey Albert. I'm just trying to get you guys likes, okay? We got this. Um, <laughs> so, so Kelsey, though, actually, I am going to have you del delve in there a little bit a little bit more. Um, what? Do you think it was simply that you were able to control the menu more? I mean, that's it? Yes. And I think that a lot of times, some of the holiday gatherings we go to, there's more like store-bought foods. And I think that a lot of store-bought foods, um, because they're artificially flavored or they rely too much on maybe like a heavy dose of just flat out sodium. Um, and, and I'm not opposed to salt, but just that it they just they're flavorless to me and that wasn't necessarily the way it was in the beginning for me but it's, that's the way it, it has become so sure. um, i think your palate shifting is important but also you know i took care of kind of menu that had variety that had seasoning that had all of these really great um aspects to it not just like hey here's a box of, or a bag of chips and you know 15 different kinds of pre-made dip you know yeah. I, I will tell you this, Kelsey. Um, my wife and I, a few months ago, we actually bought um, little mini Himalayan pink salts. Mm -hmm. She keeps them in her purse and I keep them in my yeah. in my uh, bag so that if I'm ever out any place, it's like I don't have to use the, the table <laughs> salt that's iodized and bleached and all of that. I can I can pull out my little like pink salt yeah. packet. And, uh, Those things are so nutrient dense. Like They're so rich in minerals and vitamins trace amounts of this and that it's yeah. awesome tastes yeah. great too sean what about you man um how did you how did you do over the holidays were you uh were you in a small bubble or were you with larger groups of people how did that work for you with eating it was fine i mean i don't like i don't have a big family anyways so i know for like thanksgiving if we kick it back a couple extra weeks like i smoked a turkey which obviously you know i have the control over anyways um yeah. Hey, like Kelsey mentioned, like my family tends to rely on more store-bought stuff. Like the mashed potatoes are always from scratch. But it's always like box stuffing and, you know, your typical like green bean casseroles and stuff like that. And it like, I, I definitely ate, you know, their food, but I relied more on the things that I had prepared. Um, Christmas was about the same. Like uh, we, we hosted, so we kind of finger foods for everybody. So I ended up like smoking some chicken wings. I think we made like a we made a like a breakfast casserole with which was all you know really good food, eggs and you know bacon and stuff like that. So yeah. I I say I fared pretty well, pretty well. Good. This was uh, so I, I get to do a humble brag here. This was actually the first November through December that I lost weight. So I actually yeah, went, man. I went in the right direction over the holidays. <laughs> right. um, and I think part of it was that we, there was a lot more homemade food for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, my wife, we, we don't have access to the smoker like that, Sean, but I now know where to go next Thanksgiving and next, well, especially for smoked wings. Too. Right now, so you're welcome. Come over anytime. Well, the idea of smoked wings, I just, that really actually makes me salivate just a little bit. <laughs> The thing is, is they're so easy too. Like that's that's kind of been like the big thing with like the smoker. Like chicken doesn't take any longer. Like you can bake it for forty five minutes or smoke it for an hour, and that's. I mean, that's one way I enjoy healthy eating, is just smoking everything. Sure. Gee, what about you? I mean, so 
I, so I'm going to I'm going to call you out here since Kelsey opened up the gossip channel. I get to start with you. Oh, here um, we go. No, I think you because you and I've talked nutrition stuff. Obviously, I've sent you, I've sent you my screenshots. I've reported sure. to you on my macros and all of that. Um, I need more variety, I think, than you do. Uh, yeah. So obviously, there's different personality types to this. Kelsey touched on sure. this in one of our last conversations. Um, seems to me like your discipline is stronger than your desire for flavor differentiation. Do you Maybe. agree or disagree to that? And how do you how do you kick it up and bury it? Yeah. Well. More than my I should say, you eat chili. Possibly. You eat chili almost every night. So. I do, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little later on too. It, like, well, Caroline, for starters, is a fantastic cook, and she's the one that will have little, I don't know, um, variations on the concept. So when it comes to chili, like you can start with a base, right? You can start with a base concept, a base meat, a base meal and vary it based on the seasonings, the spices, the sauces that you use with it. You can sway things a little bit more towards the savory side, a little more towards the sweet side, and it can have a different impact on your palate that way. So I'm having the same base meal pretty regularly. I'm shifting some of the, the I don't know, what's what I'm looking for? Some of the like variation, variations on a theme it sounds yeah like. there's a i don't some of the fancy details i guess that's where i get the variety in okay. and everybody needs both like everybody needs both consistency and variety in their lives as two of tony robbins core human needs mm. it's a question of how much you need of each one some people need a lot more variety some people yeah I, I'll just, I'll just toss it out there as a, as a consideration. Uh, being an entrepreneur, my entire life is a roller coaster of ups and downs. And so I feel like I don't, I don't search for wild variety and volatility in my food because we have that already, just being in this lifestyle, if you know what I mean. I think if I had a regular nine to five job where it was essentially the same day over and over, like I was living Groundhog Day, I think it would be an entirely different experience. I'd probably be, want to have a different meal every week. You know what I mean? Sure. I think, so I think that's a really good point. I mean, obviously the lifestyle kind of depends on that. And, and one of the things, and Kelsey, I can't remember, I'm going to toss this at you. I can't remember uh, if you said your husband likes more variety than you or vice versa. I don't, I don't remember what you said, but you held up that comparison for us in one of our last conversations. Um, I think probably what I was talking about specifically was our personalities on eating. Like he was a moderator and I'm an abstainer. So we have conflicting areas there. So we have to, I have to be careful not to eat his like sweets or else he gets really mad. I'm like, you didn't eat that chocolate <laughs> bar in one sitting. That Where did I that sleep of cookies go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but I agree. I think everybody has different needs for this. And I mean, for example, I eat the same thing, pretty much the same thing for breakfast and lunch all week long and then make make variety within our dinner. Um, so I, I think that is a benefit yeah. where know yourself, know what you need to be satisfied to have your needs met and plan from there. Sure, sure. Sean, what about you? Any thoughts on that, on the variety element? Uh, I think I, I like what Greg said when he said, like, you have the same base. Like, I think you can kind of, like, deconstruct every meal towards, like, it's a base. Like, it's it's got, like, some overreaching name, like chili or pasta or, like, a scramble. I think like you you get variety based on kind of the what 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 elements make up that meal. I think that's where I tend to get variety, and I'm definitely more of a variety person, um, which hasn't always been the case. Like that's been a shift that's happened over the last six months, I think. Okay. Because um, like I mean, for probably two years, I ate the same breakfast, I ate the same lunch, I ate the same dinner, I had the same snacks, like to a tea. Like it was all weighed out the same, it was all cooked the same, and yeah. There is literally zero fluctuation, and then over the, like the last six months, I've noticed like a I need more variety just to stay, stay interested and stay satisfied. So like I, I've kind of gone through both phases. Okay, and I'm currently in a variety phase, and I think, but like like I said, like I like how Greg kind of outlined it. Like you have a base, 
how you make up that that meal can shift and that's where i tend to get my variety from okay so, so what i was trying to think of was nuance by the way it occurred ah. to me <laughs> we can make things a lot of nuance based on what the base is sure so so sean you you smoked this turkey you didn't uh, you probably didn't did you just eat turkey for the next four or five days or how did that how did you nuance that up a little bit for yourself you didn't really have a whole lot of, like i didn't do a whole lot of leftovers I, I think i maybe took like one meal for later that night okay um, it was like it was back to normal the next day got it to the point where like i just kind of left the turkey there and they kind of just picked away at it <laughs> do do what thou wilt with my turkey yeah and like, uh, I, I will say i did so i made a gravy out of like the giblets and the neck and the liver and all that mm -hmm. and that was fantastic i definitely took that home sure nobody wanted it after they learned how i made it either. <laughs> so i i want to jump in too because we had a 14 pound turkey for two adults and two kids under the age four and under. So we had tons of leftovers. Um, and it was interesting because I think a little bit of planning can go a long way when it comes to making eating healthy, enjoyable, because we have a smoker as well. And I think Sean is probably the smoker king in this conversation. We don't use it nearly as much as you do, but we were going to smoke a turkey because the smoked turkey on Thanksgiving is fantastic. But the problem with it was that our broth, because I made broth out of the carcass, Mm -hmm. um, and everything we made from it was going to have a smoked flavor, and I didn't want that. I wanted to have some versatility, so we just baked it like a bunch of normal people. So we, um, but I made a, I made some soups out of it. There's a couple of really good, like any soup that has like a chicken base, you can just throw turkey into. So I made some soups out of it. I made a turkey stir fry, um, and then I forget what the third thing was, but I had another meal that I made just out of that turkey, and it was all different. Like none of it had the thanksgiving base to it sure. so um so it was a nice variety and it was again just a little bit of planning for the rest of the week and it was nice to have that whole or all of that meat ready to go so so sean you had mentioned you had mentioned this idea that you're kind of in a variety phase right now you were in a more consistent phase up until about six months ago um were you just getting bored with the same old same old is that why you needed the shift yeah, more more or less. Okay, so so um, so Greg, with when you when you mentioned when you mentioned this nuance of flavoring, that variety kind of keeps you interested as well. Yeah. So um, why do you think it's important? That I think the nuance is important. I think that's true. But why do you think it's important to emphasize? Um, because we've talked about the idea that f food is fuel, in essence. Absolutely. And so, yeah. like Kelsey said, what are your a couple of weeks ago? What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish this with this? Are you cutting? Are you are you working more toward uh, competition, et cetera, et cetera? So you use the food as fuels. But why do you think, G? Uh, why do you think it's important that food should be enjoyed versus we need to look at it like, no, it's just fuel. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think one of the most common myths or objections that people have to the idea of changing how they eat is, you know, people fear leaving everything that they enjoy about food and replacing it with flavorlessness or boringness or, you know, repetition for some people. They just, they don't dig it. And the most important thing you can do is to make it sustainable for yourself, to make it where you can make it a lifestyle. And it, and it, a lot of people do use food as an avenue for pleasure, and that's not wrong to do. That's not wrong to do. It can become troublesome if you take pleasure in things or, or in certain doses of things that are harmful or self-destructive to you, but food should absolutely be enjoyed. And you know, I think if we can create avenues for making it enjoyable, more people would embrace the idea of just getting started, just trying it out. I think more people would actually embrace healthy eating as a lifestyle, not just a short-term temporary change. If you know what I mean. Yeah, and we've talked about the idea that um, food can act as a sedation. It can act as a celebration. It can act as a comfort. It can like there's all these elements that food uh, definitely can can be a crutch for people. So uh, so it sounds like you guys are all kind of thinking in the same way when we talk about that idea of like food. Yes, it's fuel, but. Um, if you're enjoying it so much to the point that it's an emotional or physical or whatever kind of crutch, that's a bad thing. But to, but to go so stale with it, 
sounds like that's going to lead toward implosion as well, right? We need flavor. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Kelsey, what are your uh, thoughts? Well, to piggyback off of what Greg said, when, when we have to leave behind a way of eating that we've known our whole lives, um, it is not, it is often, there is emotional grief associated with that. And I think that is for people that are a little more utilitarian or who maybe have made that process or have, have made that journey before, we forget that. But um, there is grief in thinking of giving up something that you have such a strong emotional connection with. So um, yep. if somebody's just getting started, remember that this is not the end of, of great tasting food. It's the beginning of great tasting food that's better for you. So big, big thing to remember. That's really important. How, how would somebody, how, how do you, how, when you have your clients, um, and there is that conversation about like, hey, obviously the food you've been eating has not served you in a way that's healthy. And you do have to kind of guide them through that little bit of grief, I imagine. What does that look like for each of you? Guiding a client from, oh, I'm never going to, I need to let go of this because there's an addiction problem toward it or whatever it might be. And the natural emotions that go with moving away towards some of that. How do you how do you guide your clients through that? So I really try to pave the road with them and say, point out that that it's okay for you to grieve the loss of food, right? Like we think that's a silly concept, but it the entire way our entire society frames life around food, it should be expected. So I think just letting them know that this is natural, this is okay, and rather than pushing away those feelings, lean into them, think about them, journal them if you like to journal, do these things. Um, sometimes we'll even go, it depends on how much, how hard of a time a client is having. We'll even talk about like the five stages of grief, right? Um, mm -hmm. And talk about getting to the ultimate acceptance that these foods do not serve you. I really liked that you use the phrase do not serve you. I've been using that a lot lately. And if something doesn't serve you, it has to go. But it doesn't mean that it going is going to be easy. Sure. Um, Sean, what are your thoughts on that? With Have you had to guide someone through and what did that look like? Sure. Uh, it's definitely a process. Like there, there's definitely, you know, kind of going back to what Kelsey's point about like abstainers and moderators. Like there's some people that go really well with cold turkey. There's some people that need to kind of gradually let go of something. Um, and it's just kind of meeting them where they're at and you know, setting that stage so that they are successful with being able to, to let something go. That's again, not serving them. Um, and, and I think it's really important to kind of, you know, not only just be like, Hey, you can't have that anymore. Like that's, that's just not on the table. Like we're just not going to do that. Um, you kind of show them, like you kind of help them bridge that gap from whatever, you know, a certain food is to something that is better suited for it. Um, and try to help kind of help them replace that with something else. Um, it's something I've found helpful. It's really, really helpful to set expectations at the start of the journey. The body does not like change. Mm -hmm. A body, it's you know used to something. It doesn't like change, and if you change your diet, especially like you make wholesale dramatic changes, which by the way, for a lot of people is the best way to go. You make wholesale dramatic changes. Food being the most common drug that there is, it will change your hormones. It'll change how you feel, and a lot of those feels are really, really strong. And if you don't go into it with an expectation that you're going to really feel something, and your yeah. body a lot of times your body will fight back. Sometimes it's the addiction that you have to something that fights back at you, but your your body's going to fight back. And like all of these emotions, I think that's why the first two, maybe three weeks of any nutrition plan are the hardest is because there's internally, there's so much change. But one of the cool things is I see a lot of times when you get to around week three, the body gets smart the body adapts, the body gets better at metabolizing vegetables versus processed carbohydrates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden you start feeling really, really good. But it's that first, you know, couple of weeks sticking point. Mm -hmm. Setting expectations is really important. So people know, hey, this is going to be a little bit rocky and choppy and you're going to be tumble and you're going you're gonna, to, it's going to be a little hit and miss. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to, you're going to falter. You're going to mess up. It doesn't mean you're broken. Everybody makes mistakes. Everyone's going to feel all the feels right out the store because on the other side, it's amazing. 
-hmm. Any thoughts on that, Sean or Kelsey, any additions? I agree. I had a thought when Greg first started talking, but then I was like into what he was saying. I'm like, yes, it is worth it. It's so much better. On you got to keep that pen and paper nearby. I know. Um, well, and uh, I do, I want to come back to something, I guess, to what uh, Gia originally said, because when he was texting me this weekend about having this podcast, I was like, okay, but I want to add a caveat to this entire conversation. Um, and it's sort of this mentality when we start out of, one, what do I have to do for right now? A lot, a lot of times we come into it, it's what do I have to do for right now to get results? Like not necessarily thinking about the future, which that short-term approach works for some people, doesn't work for other people. But the thing I want to caution about is sometimes I hear people say, um, I can't eat well, eat healthy because it doesn't taste good. And when I dig in a little bit, what that actually is, is that code for how do I keep eating Doritos and cupcakes and look like a fitness model? And so <laughs> I think we need to get really honest with ourselves. Um, are you willing to try new foods? Are you willing to season? Are you willing to put some time and energy into making this change so it works for you and it works for your family and it's something that can last for a very long time? Maybe not perfectly for a very long time. That's, I think, a little unrealistic. But is what you're doing manageable? Sure. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a. Uh... You know, it's interesting. You mentioned the, can I still eat the cheeseburgers and the cupcakes and the this and the that? Because there's also, uh, you see these social media influencers, you see the hot models on Instagram and they're like, huh, look at me with my big old cheeseburger that's dripping out. And you're like, oh, well, I, so can I eat like that and still look like that person? And uh, I think it's definitely, um, not that you don't, occasionally unbuckle the belt. I mean, Kelsey, you and I've joked about this. Um, I have to be like a ninja with my nutrition or it goes, I'm, I can't, I'm, I'm a little bit on or off. It's more of a switch than a dimmer for me, uh, at least right now. Abstainer. We found an abstainer. Yeah. <laughs> and and my, my wife jokes about it because she'll be like, man, that, that ninja belt's either cinched really tight or you're, let, you're just open robing it. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of how it feels in my world. Um, but, but I think, uh, I, I do think we need to get honest with ourselves. Like you just said there about the changes that we're willing to make. Um, cause I remember G there was a point a couple of months ago where I looked at you and said, if you told me right now, I gotta, I gotta let go of homemade chocolate chip cookies. I can't do it. Like I just, I, in my mind to think the next 40, 50 years, I can't do it. Um, of what that would look like. And you're like, well, maybe it'll only be 20 if you keep eating them, which I thought was a funny response. But um, I said that? That doesn't sound like me at all. I think no, was your I, we were going back and forth. There's a chance I made the joke and we just started laughing about it. <laughs> but, uh, um, Sean, when have you had any situations, and again, we don't necessarily need to name a client by name. Well, when I worked with Tony, he had blah, blah, blah. But now let um, me tell you. But that like, clown. yeah, exactly. Have you had a situation though where you've said to somebody, "Hey, you need to consider if you ever need to even put that in your mouth again"? Um, you know, there it, not necessarily in those words. There has been like a your the way I'm kind of getting your question is like, have you had to have that like come to Jesus moment? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I actually just had it uh, Saturday um, with someone. And it's not always the easiest topic to approach. Fortunately, like at least they like, say, I'm paying you for this. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like, and it's, and it wasn't, it's never, it wasn't, it has never been like my first approach. Like generally, like it's, I try to take a much softer approach other than like, Hey, can't do that anymore. We got to knock that off. Like it's, you know, and, but at some point, like you, you come to a point where you've tried varying tactics with, you know, trying to ease off or cutting back systematically until it doesn't exist. And there definitely comes a point where like, you know, there, there's this hard line and it has to be set. And it's a lot easier if you know how to approach that line. Like I've been in that situation before. So I know, you know, from an emotional standpoint, how that feels to like have someone say that to you. And I think like kind of coming into it with that experience helps a lot, but yeah, for sure, for sure. Gee, what about you? Have you had to have that hard conversation with people? Yeah, I'm a big believer that some people 
just have addictions when it comes to food. And I still have never heard of the, you know, alcohol addiction, cocaine addiction program where they give you systematically smaller doses of alcohol until eventually you don't need any. That's not how breaking an addiction actually works. Yeah. Right. So like, this kind of goes to what Kelsey believes with abstainers and moderators. I, we, me as an abstainer, I think for you, Dallas, the amount of emotional energy that it takes to eat only some amounts of some foods is actually more energy than it would take for me just to avoid it entirely. Sure. For me, it's easier just to avoid it entirely. Sometimes that's also the, the clients, you know, but one of the cool things that, you know, since Kelsey has clued us in that there are people who are, who are, who are moderators or people who are abstainers, we can identify that and identify, all right, which approach is right for Dallas? Which one is right for Sean? And it sounds like you guys would be on opposite end of the spectrum. Like Dallas would be an abstainer and Sean would be a moderator. Yeah. Gee, I yeah, it's all that, you not in there. Go for it. Yeah. That um I've spent like my 2020 focus has been studying food addiction, if you can't tell. Um, but um I think G hit it on head. Like we don't send people to rehab where they're giving them just little amounts, right? And and you'll be considered no longer an alcoholic if you can go to a bar and only have one drink, then you're successful, right? But that's what we tell food addicts, that's what we tell high abstainers is that we're gonna do this and then someday you'll be successful when you can only eat one chocolate chip cookie and you don't end up with your face full of heart and Ben and Jerry's because hey, I've been there. Like I I have um, really worked on my food sobriety and it is on the other side of it, it's very freeing. Um, to be able to say, I don't need to eat that. And I know that it, that, that no longer serves me. And I, that's a very hard and scary concept for a lot of people. So I don't want to necessarily turn this conversation into why everybody needs to give up chocolate. But um, again, I think we need to pay a little bit more attention to how we approach somebody with a food addiction um, or who sure. is a high abstainer, right? We can't just green light and small amounts of things that triggers that trigger people. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think to that point, um, I think there's a, for you all as coaches, that's where the empathy of it comes in as well. Like, how do we guide you through this process? And, um, and I know there was, a, a, it may have been a couple of years ago now, there was a popular book series, Eat This, Not That, mm -hmm. you know, choose this over that sort of thing. How do you, when you when you're dealing with a client, and we'll we'll go back here in a few minutes um, to as we wrap our conversation. I want to go back into some of the best tips and tactics and practices of making food more enjoyable, repeatable, more delicious, et cetera. We'll get back to that, but I think we're on a good point here because I think some people need to hear this today. Of how do you walk someone through? Man, we keep we keep harping on the cookies. Those cookies aren't serving you. You're totally addicted to them. You can't eat just one. You're struggling every time you do it. You fall off the wagon. You have to get, and then you feel like a piece of crap as a human right. because you've done so. So if those aren't serving you anymore, let's guide you through this process. And, and Sean, to use your phrase, have that come to Jesus moment where it's like, hey, let it go and let's move you toward it. What might be a practical way to walk them through that freedom process? What does that look like? Is it a this, not that sort of food conversation? I think it can be. I think that we all have trigger foods, right? So for me, mine is chocolate. And I can tell you guys that I haven't eaten a piece of chocolate in 65 days. Over the holidays too, right? Like this has you. really been, thank you. This has awesome. really awesome. been something that I have been leaning into because chocolate triggers a binge, right? And then, um, so, so I don't even know, I just got distracted. Um, so my point with this is that um, we have to realize which foods trigger a binge and find ways to um, create space between people and those foods. And I think that every person who has an eating disorder or, uh, sorry, an eating addiction and then, or is a high abstainer has this voice of sabotage. And I like to compare that voice of sabotage to the worst boyfriend or girlfriend you have ever had. And they are going to say things like, you need me, like you can't get along without my advice, right? Like just eat that cupcake. You can kick it out of bed in the morning, right? Like no big deal, but you need to have that now and, and start to recognize that voice of sabotage as 
um, somebody who does not have your best interests at heart and speak truth back to that voice of sabotage and say, no, I cannot have that cupcake because I know historically, if I have one, I'm going to be digging through the freezer in about 20 minutes, searching desperately for a popsicle I hid six months ago from my kids. That is not who I want to be. So um, recognizing and identifying that all that voice of sabotage can do is um, plant seeds of doubt, plant seeds of thought, and then you have the ability to step back and say no and stop. Um, what's the, it's like halt. It's are you hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? Lonely and tired. Yeah. If yep. you are any of those things, making a food decision probably isn't in your best interest. So if you have to make Agreed. a food decision at that point, stop and think about it. Stop and ask someone for help. Stop and, and figure it out. Absolutely. That's good. I like that. Sean, anything you want to add to that? I think just expanding on like the, the practice of mindfulness regarding food and how it surrounds that. Like, are you eating again? Like you kind of go back to hall, like you have it up on the screen. Like what, what is your, what is your draw and your desire to eat, you know, the chocolate chip cookie? And is that going to help you or is that going to hinder you? Like, are you doing it because you, you genuinely enjoy it and it's bringing you happiness? Or are you just doing it because like, that's a, that's a fallback that, you know, eases stress or, it's just something you're hard when you're sad, right? Um, and this is kind of, you know, again, bringing a sense of mindfulness into it so that you, you are not only, you know, hopefully abstaining from the, the act of eating it, but also learning yourself and your body more. Mm. Yeah, I think um, one of those things for me was uh, it's on the nights that my wife and I sit down to watch a show and it's like 8.45, 9 o'clock at night. And it's just immediately, I'm like, well, what do we have? You know, because there's, there's also a habit there. So it's like the hungry, angry, lonely, tired, but there's also, G, you mentioned bored. Yeah. There's habit as well involved in some of that. Like, oh, this is a time we normally eat. And I think, Kelsey, to something you said earlier about just the holidays that we've just been, have gone through. There's food readily available to just go pick and grab and you you get a little snack play if you're going to play a board game or watch a movie as the family or whatever it might be. So there's a lot of habit stuff involved as well. And, and, and Sean, I think to your point, mindfulness is really a key there. Gee, what, what's some of the ways that, um, that you train mindfulness with your clients? Awareness, mindfulness, whatever of that word you want to put on it. Uh, as they're as they're going through their nutrition process with you. So I've noticed that anybody who doesn't journal or record their food, who goes to a practice of recording their food, there's an immediate shift in the direction of slowing down and thinking before you eat. There's a lot of people, everything is autopilot. Like I have this at lunch, I go to the same restaurant, or at dinner, we go to the, we do whatever at dinner. And it's the autopilot, but people that start recording what they eat immediately, especially if they have to share that food journal with somebody else, like a coach, they immediately become a little bit more mindful, a little bit more intentional, a little bit more conscious about their food choices. So that's one. I think that it's valuable to put space for thought in there as well. Like, hey, so good friend of mine, Don Yaxtis, one of the, the best dudes I've ever met, he, he had a strategy that we adopted a long time ago and I love, which is like if you've had your the dinner you plan to have and now you're tempted to go back and have a second plate or ice cream or whatever cheat food, right? He's like, drink a cup of water, wait 10 minutes and ask yourself the same question. Do you still want it? Building in some margin, some space for thoughtfulness is so valuable. So you're not constantly living in reaction to your urges. You're not constantly living at the mercy of your urges, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. 100%. And I think that's a great point, G, the, the guardrails you're talking about, too. So this goes into, like, can an abstainer ever have a chocolate chip cookie? Well, maybe, right? Like, so if we have these guardrails in place where the only place I can ever have a chocolate chip cookie is when we're out of the house, like I can't bring them into the house at a holiday, at a special event, something like that. Like I'm building in clear guidelines 
uh, guardrails and and being very mindful of how I approach those foods, then that is a situation where maybe it can be on the table for some people if we're putting in proper guard, guardrails. Yeah, that's intriguing. Um, I mean, I, I remember, I, I'll even just say to my kids now, don't, don't grab the bag of chips and just eat out of the bag. Get a little side plate, put out the portion you're going to have, and then put the bag away. Otherwise, you sit there and just pull out of the bag and you're not thinking about it. And I remember another technique um, that someone had taught me was simply the idea of in between bites, set your fork down in between yeah. bites. Because A, it slows your pace of eating, and B, you have to mindfully think about pick the fork back up versus right. this technique of just shovel, 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 talk, talk, talk. And you're hungry, right. so you're doing it faster. But if you set the fork down, and uh, my wife remarked um, not too long ago, she was like, man, you're taking twice as long as everyone else to eat yep. right now. And it, it, it helps in the pacing and, and in the amount. There's a lot of little variations on this too. There's, all right, you have to chew 10 times before you swallow. There's, you have to eat one bite, then drink a sip of water before you go back to your next bite. There's a lot of variations on that, but it's all the same concept. It's trying to create space where you can be mindful about what you're eating, not autopiloting a bad habit over and over and over again. Sure. Sean, thoughts on that? I mean, any other tips that you th can think of? No, I think that's that's great. I think any 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 form of that is very well placed. Like I don't like I've worked with it both personally and with clients that tend to be more social and you know have a tendency to be heavier drinkers. Uh, like have a drink, but then have like an eight ounce glass of water in between. Yeah. For I mean, for the couple of people I've had to use it with, like it almost immediately cuts out their drinking from what would normally be ten glasses of wine to one or two. Sure. I mean, that's, again, just another example and a different take on, on that concept. All those people must be in sales, right? Because <laughs> they're hobnobbing, talking. You know. <laughs> um, I think this is really good. And I think uh, for those of you who are listening to it, I think this is a really good conversation. And I'd, I'd challenge you to think of what are other little techniques that you can think of that would add mindfulness, slow the pace, get you out of automation, and get you more into that um, deliberate way of eating. Uh, but ultimately, it comes back to this right. idea. Yeah. Can I throw a thought on that? So Yeah, please. What I find is that like, that it can even help make eating more enjoyable if you learn to slow down and savor what you are eating. It can enhance the experience for you a yeah. lot. My love, my, like, my love, Caroline, is just a big believer in like, eating slowly to really, really enjoy the food and try and pick up on the hints of this and the wisps of that that she mm -hmm. put into her elaborate chili dish, for example. Yeah. No, that's great. I, I had read a couple of years ago, I read a, uh, a book called Savor. And yeah. um, the author actually talked about the fact that when you first sit down, you actually take a moment to feed your eyes before you start eating. You, you take in the plate, the colors of this or that, you feed your smell, you feed the senses. So you actually feed all the senses before you feed your taste. And you even feed like, uh, the other night I had I had a ribeye and I had Brussels sprouts and cauliflower medley. And to take a moment, and my wife and I talked about it at the beginning, of uh, sit there and think of the farmer who raised the cow and the, and the uh, and, and Kelsey, I know you're into this with regenerative farming as well, but think about all that went into the plate that I'm about to enjoy. And that slowed the pace down as well as gave me gratitude for what I was about to enjoy. Um, so I think there's a lot of tips. So yeah, um, moving back to the enjoy conversation, let's get very practical here for our last 10 minutes of our conversation. Uh, just round table this, what are some of the best tips, tactics and strategies that you all have for eating in a healthy way to make it enjoyable? Not just think through counting your macros or this or that, but how do you make it delicious? How do you make it exciting? How do you make it repeatable? We can get as granular as we want to on this. Sure. So I got one. hit it. I got one. I love, 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 love my breakfast. And I kind of like walk you guys through. So I, uh, the, 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 the main course of breakfast, and I have a few of them. The main course of breakfast 
starts with like stovetop, a skillet with some avocado oil or some ghee in there, and then a layer of spinach, then five whole eggs. And what I do is like I fry it up and I mix and I turn it. And when it comes off the stove, you have this warm, like this, you know, very, very like comfort food e type warm deliciousness that I then pair with like cold salsa that I take out of the fridge. Hmm. For me, it, it adds drama to the food if you have these contrasting temperatures in the same meal. So I put the warm of the eggs and all the other stuff I have it with it with the cold of the salsa and like that dance, the interaction of the warms and the colds is sure. so awesome. It's so delicious. I absolutely love it. I cannot recommend it enough. And I use this concept quite a bit, like especially around this time of year, you know, a lot of folks like to have warmer foods, warmer drinks. I like to have a contrast there. Like I'll have my food warm and my drinks cold. So there's the the hot cold. Every time I, I have a bite, I drink a little bit, hot, cold, hot, cold. And it creates like some drama and like the down, the, the interaction there. I love it. It's, it's fantastic. So that's really good. Um, so temperature. Yeah. I mean, uh, Kelsey or Sean, do you have a temperature thing that you like to play with? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in the most, succinct, <laughs> the most succinct answer of the day, Sean lets us know. No. Yeah. Kelsey, what about you? Anything temperature wise that you? I don't think that I have ever put that much thought into it, but I'm going to start noticing it now. Um, mm -hmm. I do. I am weird. I love soup all year round. So I'll eat hot soup on a 110 degree day and be super, super happy with that. So um, eat what you like. That's that's one of my tips is um, don't just because it's summer you, doesn't mean you can't eat soup. And just because right. it's the middle of winter doesn't mean you can't have like cold potato salad. Like find a healthy version and you do you like there's nothing wrong with that. What, uh, Sean, what about you? Any, again, we can get as granular as you want, but what's like some tips and tactics that you think of? Um, I know you've mentioned the spices in the past um, mm -hmm. in previous conversations, but something to make it more delicious, more exciting, more repeatable. Yeah, I think, so Greg mentioned comfort food and then Kelsey said, eat what you like. And I think those two things are really important. Like we all have biases that we're gonna go to when, you know, again, we kind of go back to like emotional settings around food. Like you, you need to be able to find those things that you really, really enjoy and find out how to make them healthy. Um, I mean, and that could be like down to like a texture thing. It could be down to a hot, cold thing like G has. Like I was just working with someone that, I don't even remember what the food was, but it, it boiled down to she really enjoyed the texture contrast in a specific, generally thought of as unhealthy food. And like just with a little bit of kind of back and forth banter, we were able to replicate that very, very easily with healthy foods that feed her goals and keep her on plan. So I think taking a little bit of time to deconstruct why you like certain things, like, I mean, let's go back to chocolate chip cookies. Maybe it is just that warm, moist, um, like kind of fall apart cookie that you really enjoy. And it's more of that texture and that, that temperature how do we use that to kind of craft something to replace it so that you're still getting that satisfaction out of it, but you're also, you know, feeding your body. And I think sure. all of those things are important. And then again, that's, that doesn't get like really specific. That's different for everybody. But for me, like I'm a big fan of eggs and I really, really like cheese on my eggs. Um, now I'm fortunate that I don't really have to not eat cheese because it, 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 it agrees with my body and things like that. But if I have too much of it, I can definitely tell like my fat amounts are getting way too high. So I, I use that to my advantage and that I, I limit the amount of cheese, but I still have a little bit of that kind of gooiness that I like about it. Um, and I just kind of stick with the same breakfast every day. Uh, hot sauce and salsa on everything. Um, doesn't matter, you know, <laughs> you put salsa on it. Sure. Um, How's that sushi treating you? Fantastic. Do we have any Mexicans also? <laughs> Who needs wasabi? Just dip it in. Uh, <laughs> I think it's. I think it's really important to encourage people to lean into their texture preferences and not fight them, because I've never had anybody fail to meet their nutrition goals because the they couldn't they couldn't achieve the texture that they wanted. Like some people do better 
with chewy or mashed textures. Other people really prefer crunchy textures. I'm a big fan of preparing your vegetables or carbs, for example, in whatever way matches your preference. Like you prepare kale or Brussels sprouts as crunchy in the oven at 400 degrees with some olive oil and pink Himalayan sea salt from, from Dallas, right? <laughs> I saw a meme this last week, total side note. I saw this meme this last week and it was a, somebody was cooking kale in a pot, you know, in the stove top. And it said, if you add, if you add uh, avocado oil to your kale, it makes it easier to scrape into the trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that. <laughs> I heard that was pretty fun. I would definitely say texture is something I, so for me, um, I found a recipe for a, uh, it was in a book called Paleo in 28. It's um, a paleo hash, breakfast hash. And I kind of made it my own, but it's basically um, sweet potato kind of base. And the sweet potato can either be mashed or chopped, but it's a little softer of a texture. But then you add um, you add white onion and bacon into it, and you serve eggs over easy, kind of on top of it. Mm -hmm. So it's like three textures all in one. You get that gooey of the egg over easy. You get the crunchy of really crisp bacon, but then you get that mash flavor. And one of the things I really enjoy about it is the fact that there's a lot of varying textures just in that one bowl. Um, yeah, so I think texture is huge. Yeah, and you could even like I have a soup dish that I make a lot. Um, or if I'm doing something lower carb, I'll do parsnips instead. And so you can play with those sort of things, but then I'll add breakfast sausage in that too, with the bacon, with some onions, with some eggs, maybe I throw some kale in too. So you just like the encouragement of just experiment and find what you like. The other thing I'll add too, um, is use the search function as your friend. Like there are hundreds of thousands of paleo, keto, whole foods, whole 30 blogs out there that if you have a food that you're really missing, somebody has found a recipe for it, 100% sure. for sure. So so do some searching and be willing to, to try and find a recipe that meets the meets what you need, um, maybe for a food that you're really missing. It, like sure. I said, it probably exists. So we've talked a little bit temperature, we've talked a little bit textures, what might be some other ways to make your food more delicious, more repeatable, not not have a bore factor. I, I've, said this, um, I've said this before on a couple of podcasts, but not, so I talk about the importance of seasoning, um, you know, with things like oregano, spices, uh, those sort of things. But don't forget your pink Himalayan sea salt or your Celtic gray salt or whatever salt it is. Um, salt is makes everything so much more palatable. And um, it is, it makes a big, big difference for sure. sure. Piggybacking off of that, I think it's helpful if you kind of know your major palate bases. And what I mean by that is like most people, seem to have a favorite one or two items when you look at salty, savory, and sweet. Most people, one or two is a go-to and the other ones are dispensable to them. And what's cool is that you can prepare a lot of foods with a slight bias to any of those. Sure. Like most people under eat vegetables, like across the board. I get somebody's first food journals, they are under valuing under prioritizing vegetables, but vegetables are one of the easiest foods to flavor, to taste. You can prepare them to be salty, savory, sweetish, however you want, yeah. Yeah, you can make anything out of cauliflower. It's just about. <laughs> yeah. Little did we know 20 years ago how massive cauliflower would be in today's economy. <laughs> you can't do the same with things like broccoli though. You like. Nobody wants a broccoli pizza crust. <laughs> well, to be fair, I don't want to call for it. We haven't tried it, and I would definitely entertain the idea at least once. To do a broccoli one? Yeah. Well, I, I, so I for those of you who don't know about G's Kel, so, so G, we got to talk about this. For those of you who don't know, uh, you've got a thing with broccoli. Yeah, and um, and you uh, you have a certain way you enjoy eating your broccoli. So take take just a minute, real fast, and tell everybody what you like to do with your broccoli. So I think that broccoli is. I know, I know. This is this is scientific fact. It's oh. validated by studies now that broccoli is better with mustard. Caveat or asterisk that if you don't like yellow mustard, there is no amount of broccoli in the world that's going to make yellow mustard <laughs> taste great to you. There's no getting around it. But so on, on one level, people 
maybe the Sean Crockers of the world who like to have cheese on their food, it can, in some sense, address that psychological desire for cheese for some people. I think at a more important level, I'll, just, I'll briefly touch on the science of this before y'all get bored and fall asleep on me, <laughs> is that high heat preparation of broccoli, in theory at least, annihilates a certain enzyme called myrosinase in the broccoli. And myrosinase happens to be really, really useful because myrosinase is an enzyme that facilitates the uptake of the nutrients in broccoli. Ergo, if you do high heat preparation of broccoli, which is most of us who say, you know, raise your hand if you roast your broccoli in the oven to make it crunchy because you like that texture. If you high heat preparation your broccoli, you lose the myrosinase, you lose some of the nutrient value of broccoli in theory. Interestingly, there are very few places in all of nature where you can find myrosinase. There is only one condiment, one, <laughs> that has. We knew you were leaving here. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know what that one condiment that has myrosinase in it is? I think we're going to guess. Gee, I think you own stock in the mustard industry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that I did. I knew, I knew I would. I knew you'd geek out about that if I asked you about it. And I think everybody oh, needs to hear out about it. <laughs> and I had I had a theory about mustard and broccoli for years, but then the study came out and actually validated this. There is an actual scientific study on this topic. I am not making this shit up. I promise. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, so m broccoli and mustard are like the flower and the honeybee in nature. They have a relationship that is meant to be together. So there's that. However, I want to you know, have some breaking news here that I think I've ever discussed in any podcast is that I've taken things one step further with broccoli. I may, I may have shared this. Give it to us. Podcast. So the new way I prepare broccoli is I almost never eat broccoli plain. I actually do like broccoli plain, but it, I feel like it's a missed opportunity. Like there's so much you can do with it to make it better. So what I do is a primal kitchen avocado mayo. I do a light coating of that on all the broccoli. Yeah. And then I zigzag pattern one direction with the, the yellow mustard. And I zigzag pattern the other direction with hot sauce. <laughs> Frank's hot. And what you get is you get like the tang of the hot sauce, the richness of the avocado mayo, and the salt, the onion, and the turmeric of the mustard that all dance together. And it creates this incredible flavor cocktail that takes broccoli to like an ecstatic experience and you should try it. I have a feeling that this is gonna be the sound bite you take out just to prove your point, but everybody, <laughs> uh, so uh, I appreciate you geeking out like that. I knew you would, which is why I lobbed it at you, but um, yeah. just some ways to that we've kind of talked about making your healthy food more delicious, temperature, texture, seasonings, and of course, G-Skell says yellow mustard on broccoli. So be sure to do that. Um, so we're, we're out of time here for today, but I want to just real quickly, any of you besides this, uh, I know we've been laughing about the yellow mustard thing here the last few minutes, but temperature, texture, and seasonings, any other ways that you can think of to nuance healthy food to make it more delicious that maybe we haven't said yet? Um, adding in a layer of like acid, so lemon juice, balsamic vinegar, apple cider vinegar can help make flavors pop. I think that's the one that we kind of haven't talked about yet. That's good. I like that one. And then I, I would add too um, acid, and then um, adding in some some fat, right? Too, because fat. I mean, I don't know if you ever saw Parks and Recreation, but that's like a Chris Traeger quote. Like fat. I didn't know if you know this, but fat makes everything taste really good. Um, so don't <laughs> don't be afraid of fat either. Like um, I think the way G feels about he, G mentioned mayonnaise, and I love to put mayonnaise on pretty much anything where it makes even half a modest sentence. And, um, Primal Kitchen has a great variety. I make my own. It's super easy with an immersion blender. Um, so adding fat to things, um, olive oil, avocado oil, mayonnaise, some butter, if you tolerate it, total game changer. All right. I think, it's, I think it's important we encourage everybody to experiment with their foods and be willing to try some new stuff like the acid or the avocado mayo or whatever. But it, really important, I think we should also, you know, clarify this, that within a margin of error, and what I mean by that is you probably shouldn't make a big gamble on mass production food for a family all in one shot. Sure. Because if it goes wrong, that's a lot of food 
to sit in your fridge and a lot of food you won't have ready for the week ahead. Yeah, for sure. No, definitely experiment on a smaller scale. Uh, that's a good yeah. point. But uh, acids and fats, I think those are good additions to the temperature, the textures, and the seasonings. Um, that's it for today, guys. We're out of time. I think this was a fun conversation. Um, obviously, uh, everybody, you can get in touch with Coach Sean at Sean Michael. Um, not Sean Michaels, the wrestler. This is a different Sean Michael. Uh, there's an old school reference for you, Sean. Uh, Coach Kelsey is, of course, at Kelsey Albers, and then G Scale is at CrossFit Edwardsville. And um, you can reach out to them online. You can also reach out to us at our website, CrossFitEdwardsville.com, for more episodes of this podcast, as well as ebooks and other information. And as always, we want to invite you to join us in person. Uh, come and join us for a, uh, a workout sometime. Jump, jump in. The water is warm. Uh, we've been talking, making healthy eating, enjoyable and delicious. I really appreciate all three of you. Thank you for taking the time with us today. And um, any last thoughts before we let you go? Just want to say thanks again, Dallas, for leading our conversation here. Yeah, happy to be a part of it. Happy. It's always a learning opportunity for me as well. So thank you, everybody. Uh, for those of you listening, thank you for joining us and taking your hour. Uh, I hope you go out there and have a championship day. <laughs>